So we have a couple of different uh, blast demands that are generated. We have a surface blast demand. So if we're looking at it from an anti-terrorism point of view where you have a high explosive, you could have a car bomb that could be located on the ground. Uh, this type of detonation causes a hemispherical burst, um, as, as shown here, where you have these hemispheres which are occurring and, and radiate outward from the center of the detonation to the structure. The next is a free air burst, which is shown here. So for the free air burst, this could be a detonation which occurs in the air. This is something which is more um, of a concern for military applications when you actually have bombs falling from the sky. Um, luckily, in, in most of our US infrastructure, this is not something that we have to deal with and, and hopefully never have to deal with. Uh, but this is a type of uh, blast amount which could be generated. Um, this, this actually does occur, in a sense, for petrochemical situations where you have a, a cloud that is a vapor cloud in the sky that gets detonated. So this could occur in a petrochemical situation. Uh, but the location of where these explosions are coming from is important because it generates different types of demands on the structure. You can imagine in a free air burst, you can get some very large downward pressures on the roof of the structure versus for something like a surface burst, um, you would have this hemispherical, which would give you very large demands on the face of the structure. Uh, the last type is a air burst, and the difference between this and the other two is essentially it's a combination. So this is where you have a detonation and explosive that's not on the ground, but not really very high in the sky. And what occurs is you get a combination of the different types of waves. So you have the main pressure wave, which is generated, which are these hemisphere, which are these circular waves. But then you also have the reflections off of the ground. So you have interactions of different waves coming together. And if you're, if you're below this line, which is called the Mach front, then you end up with a uniform pressure. But above it, it gets quite complicated. So this, this type of, of event where you have an air burst does require a little bit more complex um, analysis when you're trying to predict the forces. But our most common detonation that we're worried about from an anti-terrorism point of view again, would be more of the surface burst condition, which is a pretty straightforward um, design issue. So when we have a blast occur, um, we have a number of things which happen. So this would be an event where, let's say we have a high explosive, say TNT. Um, it's maybe has some, uh, it's in a containment of some sort, maybe a shell. When that detonation occurs, you have the primary fragments, which are essentially the small fragments which fly off from the exterior of the material. So this could be the vehicle which the material is in. It could be a metal bomb, which so it could be the casing. So these are small, small pieces, small mass elements, which represent the exterior of the bomb, which travel at very, very high velocities. So from a structural design point, the primary fragments are not really a big issue. Um, there would be an issue for windows, because obviously if you have a, a small um, ballistic type fragment flying through your structure and it hits a window, it could cause uh, the initiation of cracking, which co could compromise a window. But from a column or a wall or a beam, those issues, those are not really affected by these primary fragments. Um, obviously the primary fragments do cause um, severe physical injuries. So that is a, another issue. Um, but our discussion today will focus mostly on structural response as opposed to um, life safety from a human point of view. The other important thing which happens when you have a high explosive detonation is that you end up with this pressure wave which is radiates outward from the center of the explosive. So as you get further and further away, the pressure wave gets bigger and bigger and it decreases. So the closer you are, the higher pressure you have, and it radiates outward. When this pressure wave hits objects or approaches objects in its path, such as this masonry retaining wall or um, a wall on your site, it creates a very large increase in pressure. It's, it's similar to a wind event. Um, if you're laying on the ground and a wind blows by, you don't really feel it, but if you're standing right in the direction of the wind, then you get that reflection off of you of the wind pressure. So the same thing happens with a blast event, just much, much quicker and, and much higher, obviously. Um, and for a masonry wall that's maybe unreinforced, those elements could get 
pressurized and a force put on them and they themselves become secondary fragments. So pieces of the wall could start radiating outward from the center of the glass as well. And that could hit the structure, could hit other objects in this path. Again, as with the primary fragments, secondary fragments are not a very big design concern. We typically ignore that from a structural point of view. Um, a, as with primary fragments, secondary fragments could compromise the element. I have seen situations where we had a masonry wall on the structure that we were testing and a big rock hit part of the masonry wall prior to the blast pressure and as a result it compromised the strength and the wall failed uh, prematurely. So things like that could happen for uh, weaker structural components. But in general, we, we neglect the secondary fragments. The main thing which we design for is the overpressure. So when this overpressure comes along, uh, it's also referred to as an incident pressure. So this is just the pressure that increases over that of atmospheric pressure. So as this radiating pressure comes and hits your structure, it reflects. And we have this reflective pressure which is now acting on our structure. On the roof of the structure, we just have the incident pressure because this overpressure just passes over. It's not like, it, you know, there's nothing for, there's no presented area, surface area for the wind pressure to push against. So it's just the increase in pressure which is considered the incident pressure. There's also a drag pressure which is generated, um, again, similar to wind. Um, passing by an object or water flowing through a stream, same type of concept. 